So I'm Kristen Oplanik from USA's Bureau for Economic Growth, Education, and Environment. And this is a special joint event. It is an Ag Sector Council and a Microlink Seminar. We are doubly glad to have you with us. Today we will explore two new studies on Zambia that review different aspects of the agricultural in input supply market evolution. While we all are well aware of donor obsession with scale, within the context of markets, it really is about reaching a point of sustainable viability, not necessarily number one. So why does this matter? Over the course of the discussion, we aim to discover just what factors did allow for inputs to scale and what that might mean for other markets. These cases were commissioned from different perspectives, and we got lucky that they complement so nicely. In a moment, Mark will give us a bit of context on the drought-tolerant maize study. But the Scaling Impact Zambia Profit Case Study is the first study reviewing the ex post status of business models initially supported by donors' market facilitation projects. The second is currently in progress in Cambodia. Those of you familiar with it. This study examines to the extent uh, examines the extent to which input suppliers continue to serve the small. And I'll turn it over to Mark to continue. Oh, good morning! Thank you for coming, and uh, hello to all you people online. And we have a couple special guests here today. Richard Cole who is leading our series of case studies that uh, we're just undertaking now, looking at uh, examples of successful scaling. Uh, Dr. Cole has been uh, very uh, supportive, helpful to USAID as we have, have really started to focus on, OK, how do we get some of the technologies that we have invested a lot of our research dollars in to scale? What, what kind of systems can we put in place? What, uh, what could be some of the strategies? Uh, so he has been helping us a great deal work through some of these issues. This, um, and then we've also got uh, Mr. Dan White, who is working as a technical director for ACDI VOCA. He's uh, working on uh, LEO-related activities and has also looked at uh, issues of scaling some technologies, including in uh, Zambia. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for Microlinks and uh, the Ag Sector Council to, to start doing more together. I think we have a lot of shared uh, relevant research. And, it's, uh, and hopefully, we can maximize our uh, learning by joining together in some of our, uh, our sessions. I want to uh, just frame the, uh, the study a little. So we're interested in monetizing our research. Probably in Feed the Future, we've put close to a billion dollars of, uh, of research and development money into developing new technologies and innovations. How do we get those technologies out to smallholder farmers? That's part of what we're trying to understand with uh, through the, the case studies that we're now doing. And I wanted to just put this up here because I think it just gives an idea of some of the challenges that we, we have in trying to get technologies to scale. So if you look at this, this is probably a, a matrix a lot of you have seen before. It's very commonly used with infrastructure type of projects where you've got your public goods, your private goods, you've got supply pushing. Here's demand pull. The thing is, is a lot of the research that we've invested in is in crops, say, like millet and sorghum that are down here. And there's not really a private commercial option for getting those out to small holders through public fund. I, it will take public funding. We did some analysis on sorghum and mil on sorghum in Ethiopia, for instance, and found that the uh, getting the early generation seeds for sorghum had a minus 1,200% internal rate of return. There's not any private companies that are going to be interested in financing that type of scaling of, of a, a small grain crop. On the other hand, something like hybrid maize should be totally commercially 
viable. And so some of the, the what we want to understand through our case studies in particular is how, how this works or how we can have public-private partnerships that can shift some of the, the other crops that we're looking at from more from what we would call a common good, so some of the open pollinated varieties of crops that we see over to more the, the private good quadrant. Um, I don't want to dwell on this. I just want to put this up there because it does sort of frame the way we're picking some of the uh, cases that we're looking at. So with that, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to turn it over to Richard Cole. If anyone wants to revisit this later during Q&A, we can do that. But um, Richard, the floor is now yours. Well, it's great to be here. And uh, I just want to expand a little bit on what Mark said about the studies that we're doing. We're going to be doing five country case studies, of which actually the Zambian maize case is the first. And what we're trying to understand, as Mark said, is what were the drivers and spaces that allowed for scaling up to occur successfully. And we are focusing specifically on cases where the commercial sector played an important role in scaling. Because as Mark said, uh, USAID and Feed the Future put quite a bit of money into innovations. And we all know that there are limits about the amount of money that don't. The old school model of, well, we, we put out a, an RFP or an RFA for you know $50 million for five years, and you do 100,000 farmers. Well, how do we scale that up? Well, supposedly, we do another five years and another $50 million and another 100,000 farmers. You're just never going to get to scale that way, even in the zones of influence. And so the question we were really trying to ask is, is there a way, whether USAID or other donors for that matter, can create a foundation, a critical mass, a tipping point, all of the above, that allows the types of innovations that USAID has been funding and supporting to go to scale. And so we were looking for cases where that had more or less happened to some degree or another, and what could we learn from them? And maize, hybrid maize in Zambia was one of them. I want to say that we try to focus basically on three or four factors. First of all, was there some characteristic of the innovation itself that allowed for scaling to happen. Secondly, was there some characteristic of the market system or the enabling environment? And I use both those words because I don't want you to think it's only the private sector structure or only the political, regulatory, legal, but both, including potentially government policy. And last but not least, was there some agent or driver or leader that actually proactively pushed a scaling strategy and if they did, what were the activities they did that were successful? Uh, and what can we learn from that? Okay, So um, I'm not going to read these slides. I get the impression that most people here are literate. Um, at least that's my presumption. If you're not one of those, my apologies. Okay, um, But let me just give a little bit of background, because actually this is important. Maize, historically, and particularly in the last 20 years, is only grown by small farmers in Zambia. And that has a lot to do with actually some distortions that the government has introduced in the market that basically makes it unprofitable for large farmers to do so. And we could talk about some of that a bit later. One of the points I want to highlight is the history is actually really important in this case. And, in, and we've already done a couple other cases where that's showing the case. And there are two things that are very important. Uh, I have to say, confess that my PhD is in economic history, so perhaps that's my bias. But first of all, in the case is that basically a lot of African countries had state-dominated, state-funded, state-implemented, quasi-socialist or statist, I don't care what label you want to call it, but heavy government intervention up through the early 90s. And a lot of whatever happened in agriculture, for good or bad, up until that point, had, was state-driven. In the case of the Zambia, that's actually quite relevant because hybrid maize did go to scale in Zambia in the 1980s. Uh, almost exclusively driven by government working in partnership with some of the donors, brought in people from Yugoslavia, or the ex-Yugoslavia, uh, who created a breeding program, and then they pushed through the government extension system, and a very large number of farmers, I think it was 60, 70, 80 percent, were using hybrid maize. Zambia, as some of you probably remember, was a highly indebted country. And in the 1990s, had the usual structural adjustment plan with the World Bank and the IMF. And that entire state apparatus was, was completely um, 
dissembled. All the subsidies, all the intervention, a lot of the extension system, uh, the state marketing board, the whole shebang. And as a consequence of that, the adoption of hybrid maize dropped precipitously, uh, probably to less than half of what it had been. And that state of affairs continued through the 1990s. Now, one of the other consequences, though, of structural adjustment was a dramatic liberalization of access to foreign exchange or the ability of multinationals to come in to invest, uh, free foreign exchange rates, they could take money out of the country, very liberal, hands-off market environment. And the reason that's particularly relevant in this case is because what happened, along with some other historical reasons, which I'll mention briefly, is that Zambia became the center for maize seed production for southern Africa. Okay, One factor was the climate was perfect and the location was ideal. It's sort of centrally located in southern Africa. Second, for better or worse, a lot of maize seed had traditionally been produced in Zimbabwe. And as things started to go downhill with Mugabe, um, particularly a lot of white farmers who had been traditionally the big maize producers and maize seed producers fled. And so actually when you go to uh, Zambia, a lot of the multipliers are actually ex Zimbabwean farmers who now live in Zambia. And along with that, all the big guys moved in, DuPont, Monsanto, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They did not move into Zambia to produce maize seed for Zambia. And in fact, for many years, they didn't really sell much maize seed in Zambia. They were exporting to South Africa, Zimbabwe, and all the countries in the region, I think as far up as even Kenya, Tanzania, East Africa. Well, it's not that far. There's borders there. Okay, so that's important to know. Okay, and what I um, want you to particularly think about is that then what happened is in the both in the early 2000s and the mid 2000s, there, Zambia has traditionally not been uh, food secure in maize. It has traditionally been a large maize net maize importer, and there were droughts and other food uh, adverse weather conditions in the 2000s. Particularly, I think it was 2000, 2001. I'm sure someone correct me on the years. In 2005, 2006 which spurred the government to take action. Uh, initially, the action was, we want to become food secure and food independent, but there wasn't any there there. They, didn't have, they weren't actively pushing it, though they did start to reintroduce two key uh, programs, which Dan and I will be talking about quite a bit today, one called FISP and the other called FRA. And FISP is basically an input supply program, which allowed farmers uh, to get access to a minimal amount basically enough for a hectare or a half a hectare, depending on the intensity of usage, a fertilizer and what ended up being hybrid maize seed. And FRA was a buying program where the government started to buy, uh, especially in rural areas, maize seed from maize, maize output from farmers at guaranteed prices. Okay? After the 2005-06 crisis, both of those programs escalated dramatically and steadily over the ensuing years. Okay, and so what happened was there sort of got a became a virtuous circle, in which is the government started pushing it. Uh, farmers, many of whom were old enough to remember that they had been using hybrid maize 10, 15, 20 years ago, so this wasn't really a new idea for them. Um, started to adopt it, and the seed company said, "Oh, there's a little bit of a domestic market, so let's start marketing domestically." The more they marketed domestically, the more farmers knew about this hybrid maize and were getting good results. And, um, and this was particularly supported also by CIMIT, which was working with many of the large seed companies, again, not targeting the Zambian market so much as helping them with germplasm, technical assistance, and other things to improve the quality of their uh, maize seeds. And at this time in particular, USAID and the Gates Foundation and several others were also supporting drought-tolerant maize for Africa. And this was an important part of the activities that CIMIT was doing, particularly on the research side, both working with some of the large companies to develop their own brands and also making available CIMIT-developed varieties of DTMA. Okay? So what you have then that happens, and I'm going to skip some of these because I only have 15 minutes, is you end up with a threefold. Actually, it's easier to see this graphically. So, except... So this is roughly about 2005 or 6, okay, and uh, right here. And about 2007 or 8, you can see that this really takes off, okay? And what you'll notice is several factors happening at the same time. 
You do get some bump in yields, but if you look at the scale, the bump in yields is not that big. It's kind of hard to make sense of this because the numbers bounce around. And if you think about that, that's actually quite significant. The reason the numbers bounce around is that maize production in Zambia is entirely rain-fed. And so you can have the best, well, that's not true. We'll come back to that in a minute. But improved hybrid maize seed only moderates to some extent your ability to, to balance off when you have bad or good seasons. But if you kind of average this out, you get about a 20 or 30 percent bump in productivity, which isn't bad. The big change you get is look what's happening in this n the amount of land being produced with maize. Okay, it goes from about 150,000 to 350,000, and it's pretty stable. And when last seen, was still headed north. Okay, um, the other interesting thing that's happening is more and more maize is being sold. And um, I don't have the table up here, but by the time we get around here, which is 2010, 11, 12. Um, there's such a boom in maize production, particularly because of the increase in land being planted, that actually Zambia becomes a net maize exporter. The reason I'm kind of rolling my eyes about a net maize exporter is it's a little bit more complicated than that, which is that this whole thing is largely, well, I don't know about driven, it's significantly influenced by the FRA buying program. By the time we're over here in 2010, 11, 12, 13, FRA starts to buy 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the maize that's being sold, particularly in rural areas. Okay, so if you think about it, you have guaranteed inputs at a heavily subsidized price. Okay, but not for large scale production, only for about a hectare. If you want to produce more than a hectare, you have to buy on your own, and a guaranteed market from the government that will buy. Okay. And the combination of those things is farmers started planting more and more maize. The government started buying more and more maize. And all of a sudden, the question was, well, what are we going to do with all this maize? We have more than we need. And they started dumping it, actually, in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and others at substantial losses. So technically, I guess you could call them an exporter. But I just want to put a big asterisk there that this was not an export at profit, uh, even though there is some evidence that actually Zambia does produce, uh, could compete if they didn't screw up their pricing and distortions uh, and all the other things. We could talk about that. So um, how much time have I got? Five. That's what I thought. Good. OK. So what did we learn about this, about scaling? First of all, donors did play an important role in scaling up by particularly Simmons' work and working with the large companies. Uh, and also, uh, to a lesser extent, and I want to emphasize this because Mark mentioned it in his introduction, a lot of the cement released varieties were OPVs, or open pollinated varieties. The farmers don't want them. Okay, did you hear me? The farmers do not want OPVs. So they were often given away or introduced in NGO projects or donor funded projects. And the farmers highly prefer uh, the hybrids, despite the fact that they do have to buy them every year. Though many farmers told me that, in fact, if if they have a bad year and they can't afford to buy ones, they just use them for a second year. And they don't experience that big a drop off, at least the second year uh, in uh, productivity. Um, but that was important. Second, I think we have to remember that actually hybrid maize is a pretty good thing to adopt in the sense that it's not that complicated. They didn't have to change their practices. Again, this is different uh, in Z uh, Zambia. In many countries where they grow traditional staples like maize and rice, they don't use fertilizer and things like that. They were already doing that here, okay, because of the history. All right. So the the advantage of maize it was basically plug and play. Take out the old seed, put in the new seed. Okay. You could do it at very low entry costs. So it's unlike, for example, starting with a drip irrigation. Well, you can have small drip, but even so, the smallest drips I've seen are several hundred dollars. And usually, if you're going to do a market gardens, I'm talking five hundred, seven hundred, a thousand, two thousand dollars. You can buy 200 grams of hybrid maize seed if you want in Zambia. The initial inv and as I told you, it's also sub that quantity is subsidized by the government. So the initial investment is very small. The technology is very simple. There's not a whole package of good agricultural practices that some team of agronomists have to come and sit and hold your hand for three years to get a bump in the productivity. Now, you may have noticed that the bump in the productivity we only got was about 20, 30 percent. Probably, if there had been somebody holding their hand, they might have gotten significantly more. And in fact, there is now a move in Zambia with some USAID and other funded projects 
to introduce conservation in agriculture because particularly southern Zambia is very prone to climate um, change and they're having more and more droughts and adverse weather. Even Actually, that was very interesting. We wanted to see whether the adoption of maize was driven by adverse weather and we had a conflict because when we talked to the farmers, they said, absolutely. We, our rains are delayed a month or two. Um, when they come, we have two, three, four inches of rain in like five days. Then we don't have any rain for three weeks. And then in the, we have more rain, and then we don't have rain for the rest of the season. So we plant late, our crops are wiped out by floods, we replant, and then we don't have enough rain to get that. So we are, in fact, by the way, in reaction, seeing a substantial shift to short-term, uh, short mature, maturity varieties. However, the flip side of that was when we tried to verify that statistically, we looked at annual rainfall measures and they hadn't changed. And so what's interesting about this is it's not the amount of rainfall, it's the variability about when it comes, how often it comes, et cetera, et cetera. I want to emphasize, which I mentioned before, the key factor that drove this was the existence of the large number of multinational seed companies that were already producing hybrid maize, and for this, this was like a no-brainer. In other words, don't have to do anything different. We've already got these varieties, and they now have aggressively selling. There's over, um, I think it's about 10 or 15 companies now in the country, including several domestic companies have started to come in and are producing. And I want to emphasize the dog that didn't bark. As Mark can tell you, if you buy him a beer, he will cry into his beer, or USAID's beer. One of the problems often in introducing new seed varieties is the existence of very strong state monopolies or parastatals that often control, if not the breeder seed and the foundation seed, the multiplication, and often are a very strong vested interest that are very resistant to the private sector coming in. The fact is that in Zambia, Zam seed was privatized in the 1990s, in the mid-1990s, and so therefore all the other seed companies were not competing with this big elephant that had state political support, etc. Okay. Yes, i am got one more slide. Okay. So um, some of the other lessons, I think, for USAID in terms of thinking about scaling and other donors is one of the questions that we went in to ask was, um, as I mentioned, USAID and other donors were supporting both germplasm, better seeds in general, and particularly drought tolerant. And what made sense? What we ended up seeing is that today, drought tolerant maize still has a smaller share of the market. Uh, it's only about 10 or 15%, but it's starting to take off. And, and, and I think you could put the two and two together. The reason it's starting to take off is because they're now, I should have mentioned that one of the things that I think drove successful adoption, if we go back to this slide, here is, is you see the huge bump here, uh, this sort of acceleration, and you see this huge bump here. These were really good years in terms of weather. Okay, so they got very high yields those years. So just as FRA and FISP are sort of starting to push it, the seed companies are jumping on the bad wagon and saying, hey, we can make a lot of money here. They get all this hybrid, not all, but a significant amount of hybrid maize seed out there, and the farmers have incredible years. They have huge surpluses, which they can make really good money and say, whoa, you have to, I can't tell you how many farmers, when I said, well, why do you grow hybrid maize? And they all kind of looked at me, because you'd be an idiot not to. Okay, I mean, literally that was the response, and that response was based on this experience. Even though subsequently, look what's happened to yield, primarily because of bad weather. So they're starting, to, now that this is happening, to shift towards drought tolerant varieties and short maturing varieties in response. And so back to my conclusions, it may make sense to try to get farmers to adopt some generic version of an innovation before we go with the fancy stuff, in this case, drought tolerant maize. Secondly, um, I think we'll talk about this more, but a bit controversial. One of the things we're seeing, at least in Africa, is even though it's not the flavor of the month for governments to intervene in the markets to subsidize either inputs or to buy at outputs, that clearly did play a role in the, in the situation, an important role in the situation in Zambia, like it or not. And I think I'll, I'll be provocative here. One might like to think, whether it's USAID, the World Bank, or others, is there a role in guaranteeing so access both to inputs and some kind of market support on the output side for a few years so that to minimize the risk for farmers of adopting a new technology. Now we all know the dangers of that and the dangers of that being once you create that constituency and politically all the incentives for, for the government are to not only do more of it but to keep doing it and in fact that has happened here and, and in fact now 
the May's subsidy budget, both on the input side and the output side, is eating something like 95% of the Ministry of Agriculture's budget. And there are huge complaints from all the rest of the sector that they get no support. And it's a big problem. And I think Dan will talk about some of the things they're trying to do on that. And the last thing I just want to say is that um, a key thing that we have been looking at is why do all the actors play ball? And in this case, you can see that there were incentives for the private sector. They could make money. There was a, a pre-existing network of agri-dealers, which often doesn't exist. I should have mentioned that. And that was ex steadily expanded, though, as Dan will mention, uh, and one of the things is that adoption appears to have largely started and been closer to major roads. And as you get further and further away from the agri-dealers and the roads, the, ra the rates of adoption have been much lower. We, see, we estimate an average of about 60, 65, 70 percent. Close to the roads, it's almost 100 percent. As you get 30, 50, 100 kilometers in, you're starting to see 50, 60, 50, 40 percent. And uh, because this was largely private sector driven, even though FRA and FISP do make an effort to extend out there, uh, we haven't seen small farmers have adopted everywhere, but not so much small farmers in more remote, less accessible rural areas. And so again, I think we could highlight that as an area where um, donor intervention can possibly help expand and extend the last mile. Um, but my point being that we have the incentives aligned, the government was supportive, the donors were supportive, the private sector had an interest, and this made sense financially for the farmers. And when I say financially, the last thing I'm going to say is that there's a tendency when we scale up, particularly in agriculture, to look at crop budgets. And when we run the numbers, you know, price of the inputs, price of the outputs, blah, 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 do they make money? We are finding that that may be relevant, and it certainly is relevant, because if it's a negative number, it never happens. But risk is more important than return. Let me say that again. Risk is more important than return. And in this case, the fact that FISP was limited, uh, minimizing risk on the input side by subsidizing the inputs and zeroing out the risk on the output side, basically, as I said, FRA is now, depending upon the year, buying 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the output and 100 percent of the output for farmers in more rural, remote areas has, I think, been a major driver. Again, do we want that? It's also created significant distortions in the market, not just on the government budget, but I don't have time to talk about that. It's created real problems in the processing sector. It's driven large farmers out of maize, but it has minimized risk and allowed for adoption. And so, choose your poison. I'll stop there, and we can talk about this more later. Thank you. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Dan White. I'm a technical director for agriculture at ACDI VOCA. Um, over the past two years, I've been co-leading uh, the scaling research stream under the LEO project, uh, where we've been trying to identify cases of programs around the world um, that seem like they have managed to sustainably increase smallholder adoption of improved inputs and practices um, at something approximating scale, at least scale as defined within the parameters of do donor projects, which is a slightly different order of magnitude than what Richard's been looking at. So today I'm going to talk about one of these case studies and specifically um, looking at the original Zambia Profit Program um, from a slightly different perspective than Richard has been talking about it. So I think it will be interesting to follow up in our conversations and trying to see where these might intersect. But this is really going to be looking at, you know, what did that project do right? And uh, what can we learn from it moving forward in terms of lessons to apply to other, other programs? So for those of you that might not be familiar with the project, the profit program was implemented from 2005 to 2010. So you can keep that in mind relative to the time series scales that Richard had put up there um, by NCBA CLUSA um, for the Zambian mission. Um, and it was focused on a number of different value chains, but um, ended up doing some really interesting work on expanding input supply access for smallholders. So our case study was going back last year and trying to figure out five years later um, what of those systemic shifts within the input supply sector seem like they've actually endured and how they evolved over time after the project had left. So a quick note on methodology. Um, there were several months of desk research looking at the past project reports, um, some of the other evaluation material. There's a wealth of, of uh, existing case studies and other work um, on the Microlinks website, which I would highly recommend anyone going back and looking at, um, which were a very good starting point. And that really did, I think, particularly compared to other projects at that same time, uh, Profit was notable for how um, methodically 
put its theories of change were and how articulated from the very beginning of the project both the design but also the measurement approach was going to be. So it was a really interesting case to go back to 10 years later because you already have all of that articulated approach. Whereas with most, for most programs you go back, if you can't talk to the staff that worked on it, a lot of that initial thinking around the design gets lost and hard to interpret what they actually did. So last May and June we followed up that desk research with a four to six week field assignment. I led it with uh, Paul Kalu and Kevin Lukuta, who were two Lusaka-based consultants that helped doing particularly the heavy lifting on uh, interviewing some of the in-customer farm, uh, in farmers. Um, we interviewed uh, seven input suppliers who had been partners with the Profit Project in implementing this initial model, 16 of their former and current agents, and uh, about 50 of their current smallholder farmer customers in Southern Province. So before I get into, um, into the specific findings, there are two sort of higher level takeaways that I really want to emphasize for anyone that's looking for lessons to apply um, to their own project design or implementation. Um, first, I think there's a lot of discussion, and it, particularly in some of the existing literature um, and in people I've talked to about, okay, what was it about the profit model that has really worked? And this is something I talked about with Mike Field and the point he made that I think is really, really key, which is that the, the, you know, any of these models that we found that have been really successful um, their success has been so context dependent that I think it's kind of the wrong question to say what are the successful models in terms of intervening in a value chain that are going to make systemic changes. It's really about what were the questions that that project asked that led to the development of that model in response to that specific situation. And the profit project stood out particularly at the time because of how multidisciplinary and how synthetic their design and, and analysis was. So they were not just looking at the agronomics or the economics from a transaction perspective, but they were looking at how those overlaid with the social networks. So when we talk about moving from a value chain framework to a market systems framework, this is really what we're talking about. It's trying to figure out these complex histories and how they interact with, with, with the economy, with, with economics and agronomics at the same time. So I think that's really what I would say is a universal best practice, is making sure you're asking questions across all of these different layers. At the same time, and this also echoes a lot of what, what Richard said, so I won't dwell too much on it, you really have to pay attention to these macro level trends. Um, you know, it's very easy when you start implementing a project and you've got your you know, deliverables and you're going to hire staff and do these other things. You just drill right down into trying to figure out what you're going to train farmers to do. But if you don't take the time to figure out what's going on in the overarching economy, not just an initial snapshot at project design or at the value chain phase, but really take, take a look at what the enduring trends are going to be, um, looking at what's happening in relevant other sectors of the economy, looking at what's happening to, to other subsectors within agriculture, um, figuring out what's happening to, to things like the currency. I mean, this is a huge issue right now across most of Southern Africa where, you know, synthetic inputs that are m primarily imported are suddenly overnight, over the past 12 months or so, no longer financially viable for smallholder farmers because their prices have gone up 80 or 90 percent. If you're not paying attention to these things, you can design something up front that works very well, but you're, you're almost certainly going to be overwhelmed by the by, by these, these larger effects that are operating on orders of magnitude far beyond anything any project could ever function with. So uh, in my mind, it's kind of, you know, we tend to design these projects like we're hiking, right? Where you go in and you say, okay, you've got a static topography and you're moving from point A to point B and as long as, you know, you keep up a steady pace, you'll get there. So you've got farmers that are growing 1.8 tons of maize per hectare and five years from now they're going to be growing 2.8. But it's not really like that. It's more like we're surfing, right? Where if you're a good surfer, you might have your technique and know how much effort it's going to take, but you really need to be able to read the riptide, you need to be able to read the swells and the currents and understand all of these much larger forces that are going on around you. And if you do that right, you're going to be able to go a lot further than if you're just going to be paddling to shore. But if you do it wrong, um, you're not going to go anywhere. So I think it's really important to keep track of those things. I'm not a surfer though, so I apologize. <laughs> I've mangled the sport for my analogy. Um, so a little bit on the profit project. Uh, so at the time, Profit was looking at a couple of different value chains, and um, Mike Field was, was one of the original architects of this entire approach. And so the way he described their, their design was they, they've been looking at a few different things and realized fairly, fairly quickly that the input supply sector, and particularly this mismatch between the existing network of commercial agro dealers and their smallholder customers, um, uh, potential smallholder customers, was, uh, was a real problem point in terms of the fact that a lot of smallholders were not actually buying commercial improved inputs, even though the economics were there to, to, to make it work, and there, were some, there was some sort of distribution system. So he went out and their team looked at a, at a wide range of things, and they found that there was this particular negative feedback loop that was leading to that market failure. So on the one hand, you had input suppliers 
um, and the agro-dealer networks, which were based a lot on these personal relationships, similar to the, the, the historical continuities that Richard talked about. These are largely large-scale commercial farmers that are mostly white with input suppliers who are also mostly white coming from the same social networks. And a lot of their sales were driven by these personal relationships. So you had a very small number of customers who were all making very large volume purchases, which is what drove most of the input supply sector. So their entire marketing and sales strategy was very similar to their, to their, to their social strategy, in a sense. At the same time, you had smallholders at the village level, and particularly these further afield areas that are generally very distrustful of outsider companies. So even if there was an input supplier that was thinking about breaking into the smallholder market, they couldn't make any inroads because they didn't have any of those social connections that they needed. So the profit project really focused on shifting input suppliers, on, on trying to develop a model that did two things. It would, on the one hand, shift input suppliers to what Mike Field called a mass market perspective. So getting them to start thinking about what it would take to sell large, to sell to a large number of customers, relatively small volumes that are all strangers and part of totally alien social frameworks to, uh, to the suppliers. And at the same time, figure out a way to, to, to get input suppliers to leverage the social networks at, a village, at the village level to build trust. So they de profit deployed a couple of different models, but largely ended up settling on a few different variations with different partners on a hub and spoke agent model, um, which there's a lot of really great stuff on the Microlinks web website, including a, a case study that Jennifer Sebstad did, um, another case study done under ABMAP by um, Cardno and Joe Doherty, which I recommend looking up. So I won't spend too much time talking about the specific dynamics of the model, but Briefly, the way they would work was the input supplier and the, and the village leadership would come together and they would talk about their various criteria for what one of these agents would look like. They'd select somebody from the community. That person would get trained up in, um, in marketing and a little bit of extension around whatever seed that company, mostly this was mostly for seed, wanted to sell. And then that, that agent would work on promoting the seed to his, to his or her neighbors, to bulking their orders and to working out the logistics for the for the supply to the village once they got to a minimum threshold of time. They would make anywhere from 5 to 10 percent um, the value of the seed as a commission off of that. So they weren't holding stock, they were just making commission and coordinating the transportation. So by 2010, this model seemed like it had really taken off systemically. Um, the, that uh, AMAP paper I referenced had gone out and tried to look at what the estimated impact had been. Um, found that there were new firms crowding in that the project hadn't even worked with. There were 4 million unique sales through these agent networks. Um, an estimated 180,000 farmers were getting reached through these expanded systems. Um, LUSA estimates that through, through, throughout, at their, their numbers are slightly higher even. They say it was closer to half a million uh, by the end of the project that were actually getting reached through this. And so on a lot of different metrics, the growth trajectory was really on a path to reaching population level scale. So we went out you know, five years later and said, okay, did that really happen? Well, what's happened in the interim period? And does it seem like this increased input supplier focus on smaller farmers was something that endured? And is it still going on? And I encourage anyone to read the, the paper, which is actually up on the, on Microlinks now to, if you want to get a bit more into some of the data, but for interest of time, I'm just going to give you the short spiel, which is that yes, they are, that the smallholder farmers are still a large and growing focus for the input supply sector. Um, most firms are, have expanded their rural catchment since 2005, moving into some of these areas that are further afield, and they continue to do so. Um, firms are providing an increasing variety of inputs tailored to smallholder farmer needs. So they're providing scaled down product sizing, they're providing streamlined extension, embedded extension information on those products that are targeted towards low literacy farmers. And they are now specifically marketing towards the different agroecological zones. So they're marketing their short cycle maize in areas with less rainfall there, et cetera. Firms are also ta have taken this model in different directions. So everyone that I talked to was still actively thinking about how to crack the nut of this smallholder market. Some of them are continuing trying to push into greenfield markets so they can be the first company that's really getting out in some of these more obscure areas. Um, while others have decided it really makes a lot more sense for them to intensify their marketing efforts in, in their existing catchment and try to outcompete their peers that way. As Richard mentioned, though, the profit project in part got lucky because there were these other secular trends going on at the same time that had nothing to do with it that tended to um, increase both smallholder appetite for some of these improved inputs um, and also push the input supply sector to, to, to move out, so, uh, to, to reach out to them. So there's the FRA and FISIP, which I won't talk anymore about. Um, but there was also this interesting 
thing that several input suppliers mentioned, which was that around the same time that you, in 2005, 2006, you had a, you had a crisis in a lot of the core commercial crops, including tobacco. So the commercial sector was starting to stagnate at that time and hasn't really recovered from that. And so their traditional market bait, their traditional sales market was starting to stagnate. And so at that same time, profit came along with saying, hey, you're really interested in trying to crack this nut of smallholder farmers. At the margin, I think that pushed them, and they said it pushed them to, to probably take more risks than they might have had their existing market base been, been doing well. But even within, with, with all of these exogenous factors, a majority of the input suppliers that we, that we talked to did say that profit played a really key role in terms of stimulating their increased focus on smallholders, specifically because profit insisted that it was these companies that managed the agent network, not profit. And there were two companies that I talked to who actually said the same thing, which is that in their initial negotiations with the profit program, um, they were pushing very hard for profit to be the ones who would go out and select the agents who would manage the logistics of the supply chain because they didn't really want to deal with the headache. But looking back on it now, they said that it was specifically that experience of having to go out, select staff in a way that they had never done before um, in conjunction with, this, with the village leadership to really try to actually go through the growing pains of understanding what had to change in their internal systems to make this work, to figure out what in terms of increases in revenue would be necessary to justify the additional costs in terms of logistics. It was that experience that they said really has endured in terms of allowing them to understand what it takes to get into this market and making sure that they were pushing through it. So I think that's definitely one of the key takeaways is that even, even if up front it's going to be a lot easier for you to act in that facilitative role between the agent and the input supplier, trying to move as far away from the, from, from the village as possible, keep those activities within the existing supply chain, it's going to have a lot more growing pains up front, but it can be a lot more durable. So the, the last two things that, that I'll say are in terms of learning for future projects. Um, so this multidisciplinary analysis up front is key. This is what I was mentioning at the beginning, and, and I think this is really you know, where the success came from. I mean, as far as I can tell, I'm sure there might be others, but this is the earliest example of this agent model that I've found within a donor context, a donor-funded program context. And um, I think that's mostly because they didn't go about it seeing if they could apply an existing model from somewhere else. I mean, because at this point, these agent models are pretty standard. Everyone says that they've got their own approach to it, and I think they're quickly becoming the sort of new demo plot in terms of a go-to um, approach to agricultural development. But this was pretty early, and I think it's because they didn't start with a model and see if it would fit. They started with the analysis. They started trying to look at the interplay between the economics and the social side, and then they backed out a logical model from that. And I think that's really the key. And then the last point that I'll make, um, because I think it's something that came up in talking to some of the input suppliers who had stopped, uh, had abandoned the, the, the model, is um, that it's really important when you're working, particularly at this last mile level, where you're trying to get down to work with developing either a new agro dealer or an agent who needs to develop a business model, any kind of level where you're going to be dealing with relatively small number of customers buying relatively small volumes of things, you need to be open to the fact that regardless of what your project works on, whether you, if it's a maize and rice program or you're dealing with soy and tomatoes, you need to be open to working across anything and everything that that agent could sell at the input supply level. So in order for you to sustainably increase access to that maize seed that you really want your farmers to buy, you're probably going to have to step back and look at some other higher margin products that that, that that agent could push out at the village level that are going to give them full calendar year coverage, right? Because when you're selling these, these staple food seeds, you're only going to be having a sales window of maybe eight, eight, eight weeks out of a year. And, and honestly, that seed's never going to give them enough margins to make it worth their time to continue with the program. So there was one of the input suppliers that was selling, that was using this model with just tomato seed and in the areas where the tomato production was all rain fed. So again, you only have sales for about eight weeks out of the year. And most of these farmers that were growing the tomatoes were only growing those tomatoes in maybe 20 or 30 percent of their land. There was a whole other host of things that they were growing that they had to go somewhere else to buy their seed for. But it meant that in a village of maybe 300 people, this agent, even if he was selling that tomato seed to all of them, was only making about $80 off of that. Off of that. So this company had a problem where they came back to these agents. They said they had a decent, they had a decent first season, but they came back to them 12 months later, and none of them wanted to do it again because they hadn't continued that relationship, and it wasn't really worth their time for what they were able to offer. Now, if those agents had been set up to offer poultry vaccinations, to sell solar lamps, to sell anything and everything that might have a slightly higher margin that would give them a full 12 months of, of, of sales, 
I think the, the likelihood that, that that could continue would be really, um, would have been much higher. So yeah, that's it. Okay, um, today because uh, we have these two different case studies that are complementary but not exactly the same, we've got a couple questions before we turn it over to the audience in our usual fashion. So, Richard Dan, we talked a bit about you know, the government subsidy which clearly had a role here. Can the government buy its way to food security? How much do you think the level of the government intervention mattered to the levels of adoption that you examined? Sure. Um, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, as I said, uh, they went from deficits and crises in a few drought years uh, in the mid and early 2000s to being quote unquote net exporters of maize after 2010 or 11. Uh, that said, and this wasn't the purpose of my study, so I didn't do the math, but um, one, I, I'd be willing to bet, and maybe there's somebody online from Michigan State who've done the math, because uh, they've done a lot of work. And great, by the way, I should have mentioned that a lot of, uh, even though I did a lot of field research, Michigan State has been putting out a huge number of extremely important studies for many years now that are absolutely invaluable and really have been a fantastic investment of uh, resources. Um, that if they had been purchasing that on the open market, they probably could have done so, I bet, at half the price. Uh, they were, for many years, paying well above international maize prices. And as I mentioned, when they ended up with all this extra maize, uh, they had no storage capacity, so a lot of it's rotted. I don't know the numbers, but you hear people talk about 20, 30, 40 percent has and then they dump the rest on the international market. They were paying, I heard, something like over $300, $350 a ton at points. They were selling it at $150 a ton. Uh, so that's not so from the economics. And now I understand, and you know, we could have a huge debate about it, uh, that it isn't just about the money that these countries and governments for understandable political. I mean, you can't get elected or stay in political power in Zambia without making sure there's enough maize for two reasons. Uh, Zambia is one of the most urbanized countries in southern Africa. Only 60% of the population is in rural areas. And if you don't have maize for those people to eat, you're in big doo-doo. And as I mentioned, um, for, for the urban rural population, 99% of smallholders grow maize. So for them, politically, it was a win-win to, um, on the one hand, uh, provide subsidized imports, inputs and buy the maize from the smallholders and make sure they were growing it. And on the other hand, make sure that there was cheap maize available for urban consumers. The economics were terrible, and they now have a huge problem, which maybe Dan can pick up in terms, because they're trying some new things on the input side. Uh, whether they can do that politically or not uh, remains to be seen. And, and so the question, I think, is more about, yes, you can do it, but is it sustainable financially? And also, um, if my graphs were still up there, you notice the yields were going down. Well, the fact that the yields have been really bad in the last two or three years, you may remember that I mentioned that um, the yield bumps were only 20, 30 percent. Well, actually, the last couple of years, the farmers have, the margins were sufficiently small, even with the subsidies, that the farmers have not made money. And, um, and a lot of the farmers I talked to in the most rural areas this past, well, not this season, but the 2014, 2015 season actually lost money. Uh, and which is actually is pushing them towards drought tolerant maize and short cycle maize, but they are not sure how much longer the ones that are in more remote areas or in more unfavorable agroecological zones can continue to produce them, even with the governments. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, it, that's, it's fundamentally a political question, right? That if you, if you have the, the, the funding, you can coordinate the, the capacity question but a, and a fiscal question, first off. Um, I mean, I think that it's indisputable, like Richard said, that there's a there's a correlation. I mean, the Zambia far outpaces its neighbors in terms of smallholder adoption of of improved maize, and that is almost one to one correlated with the existence of the of, of the subsidy program. Um, there's a lot of other distortions in the subsidy program as well, than, uh, aside from the ones that Richard mentioned. I mean, there's uh, there there has been when it was based on a simple paper voucher scheme. 
a really large secondary market that popped up uh, across the country where um, you know you were provided a basically a 50% coupon to take to your local agro dealer and um, and poorer farmers who really would needed the money would then sell those at 40 cents on the dollar to slightly wealthier farmers who would just collect a larger bundle so it ended up becoming a bit of a regressive subsidy through the secondary market mechanism um, and they're trying to get there are some workarounds that are kind of interesting that they're using to get around that um, they have piloted last season, primarily in southern province in, in Perry, and Perry Lusaka, a an e-voucher scheme that would provide a, a debit card that was tied to someone's national identification number that they could only redeem at um, at, a, at certified agro dealer shops. So it was also acting as a quality control mechanism for making sure that you know if you're going to be if you're going to be participating in this scheme, you have to get audited and certified that you're not selling counterfeit. Um, inputs that you're that you're otherwise um, providing uh, a baseline of, of quality um, to the farmer customers, um, and that pilot seems like it's gone very well. I haven't seen the data yet. It should be coming out fairly soon, and they're now this year actually looking to scale that up to over 600,000 farmers uh, across, I think, an additional 13 districts or 15 di districts in in the country, and trying to expand that now to become eventually a, a standard certification for any agro dealer um, that wants to work. Um, nationwide. If I could just come back in on one very important point, and uh, I do not work for Michigan State and have never worked for Michigan <laughs> State, but Michigan State did a very important study on the social impact of the input subsidy program. And one of the key things that the government of Zambia has done persistently is they are not, they explicitly did not see this as an anti-poverty program, particularly the input subsidy. They saw it as targeting emerging market, emerging what they call emerging farmers. And there isn't a strict definition of emerging farmer in terms of land size. Land size is very complicated in Zambia because a lot, there's actually, it's one of the few countries <coughs> where there's excess land and often farmers have more land than they actually cultivate. But the criterion principle was farmers that had a commercial orientation. And so, who, there, even though smallholders are often defined as less than two hectares or less than five hectares, the fact of the matter is that FISP did not go to the bottom 40% of farmers in terms of size. And so the Michigan State study shows that, again, depends on, I think we're finding this pretty consistently, that just like we've discovered with microfinance, that actually microfinance doesn't help the poorest of the poor, it helps the poor. A lot of this, these, in the Zambian case, the, even the input study helps smallholder farmers, but not the smallest of the smallholder farmers. Which brings us to the next question. How convenient. Uh, what do these cases tell us about the tension between commercial pathways to food security and the ability to reach the poorest? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is just building on what Richard was saying. This this has been a core issue. Uh, it's a core issue we're still grappling with in the current project. Um, I think it's definitely something that comes out of uh, of the learning here, which is that the you know back in the early 2000s, uh, you really did have this bifurcated agricultural sector where you had these large scale commercial farms, and then you had at least from a from a government perspective and from a private sector perspective, they just looked at everybody else um, who would be producing on less than 10 hectares. But at this point, we have a far more nuanced uh, range of production systems. And I think you're having, in a lot of these areas, um, the kinds of standard uh, emergent class formation that you get anywhere that's moving into uh, a market system away from uh, what it was essentially subsistence production for so long. Um, and no, I don't think that, I think the short answer is that, that uh, commercially oriented agriculture uh, and increasing commercialization is never going to be a pathway out of poverty for the poorest of the poor as producers or as entrepreneurs. I think we like to, I mean, it, 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 it's nice to think of it that way, but there's, there's entrepreneurship uh, in the way that it exists here, and then there's entrepreneurship because you can't find a job and you're simply trying to scrape together as much cash as you can. And that's not necessarily the same thing. And I would say that it would be that it, what I, what I, I'm seeing in Zambia in terms of how do you how do you reach those populations that are so much further away from any of these market access roads where the transaction costs are still extremely high or for the commercial input supply sector to supply even these emergent farmers they're going to have to be hitting pretty significant tonnages per farmer to be able to really make the, the economics work from a purely private sector standpoint so you're already looking at the these these people on the on the brink of 
of, of becoming an emergent to commercial farmers still need to get a little bit larger than they are now for it to really be sustained by the existing market system. I think it's very much worth looking into some of these other pathways to complement this idea of agricultural entrepreneurship uh, in terms of employment, in terms of some of these other things that are probably in the long run going to be both more highly sought after by the poorest of the poor as, as a livelihood strategy and are um, probably going to be more viable from an enterprise standpoint as well. Um, I hope that this was implicitly understood, but I just want to make it explicit that, at least for me and I think for Dan, we speak for ourselves and right. the studies we did are not for USAID. Of course. Um, so having said that, I think there is a real tension in this between the poor and the poorest of the poor, as Dan said. And however that's defined, whether it's defined by access to financial resources, whether it's defined by land size, whether it's defined by distance from the uh, market on the input and the output size. I mean, one of the things that we always do when we look at the crop budgets, we do sensitivity analysis. So if you up the cost of outputs by 10, 20, 30 percent because of transaction costs, and if you knock 10, 20, or 30 percent off of the prices farmers are receiving on the output side for the same reason, what effect do you get? And the margins in Zambia are sufficiently small that basically, once you start to get 50 kilometers away from these markets, these are not profitable for the farmers. And if FRA wasn't out there buying the maize at good prices, they probably, well, they would still be growing because they'd probably grow it to eat for themselves. But they certainly wouldn't be growing it at the, at the, on the size or the scale or putting new land into production, which is what I alluded to. You know, I think there's a real challenge both for USAID and other donors and for their implementing partners because of the time frames of these projects. Basically, they're trying to do two things simultaneously. They're trying to do what I would call, even though they wouldn't call it this, humanitarian assistance, which there's these really poor, tiny, smallholder farmers that will never be commercially viable, and how can we, and implementing partners are pushed to, or required to try to hit some number, 30, 50,000 of the poorest of the poor, and in fact, the USAID zones of influence, the Feed the Future zones of influence, were specifically selected with very high poverty rates, um, and at the same time, they're also trying to use market systems and value chain approaches, for which, in my personal opinion, especially in, in grains, they will never be profitable. Uh, at least not rain-fed, uh, irrigated, whole separate question. We just did a study in Senegal, which I'm writing up, which that's a different story because that was all irrigated. But for rain-fed, um, you know, and so I think I agree 100% with Dan, which is that this, call them what you want, larger smallholder farmers, emerging farmers, etc. there's definitely a possibility of reaching them, integrating them both on the input and the output side into market systems. But the smallest of the small, the you know, I think the long-term strategy is that I, that's why I said this is not USAID's position, is that, you know, we know that they need to either find other rural employment or they are going to migrate out. And we see that as happening in some countries. And I think Dan's exactly right, whether it's creating alternative rural income strategies or other things, that's key. And I, and I just want to second what he said about the, the importance of bundling. In Feed the Future, I think because of the way it was originally designed, and understandably so, there was a real concentration on narrowing the number of value chains that Feed the Future projects worked in. And the reason was because there had been a history of doing everything, okay? Um, and so, and I think we were learning now that the pendulum may have swung a little too far. Because, particularly because there's been an emphasis on food insecurity, there's been an emphasis on staple grains. And as Dan said, lots, nobody can really make money unless you lots of land, and, all, and particularly if you have irrigation or some sort of crop insurance, hard to make money on stable grains either as an input supplier or as a producer. But if you mix in particularly livestock, which for the, for the input suppliers, walking around with a knapsack of veterinary medicine, the markups are huge on that, and the value to weight ratio is huge, whereas you can carry 500 pounds of maize seed and you're never going to make a living off of that. Okay. <laughs> So if you don't get the right bundles and start thinking about this from a whole different perspective, not how do we achieve scale on maize seed and food security, but how do we create a market system where everybody's making money and as part of that try to achieve food security, we're going to have serious and continue to have serious problems in achieving goals. Thanks. And now we're going to turn it back uh, to the audience for some Q&A. Uh, but quickly first, for those of you in the room, what you couldn't see is that we were doing a of our online audience during this little discussion. 
And so, Ashley, can you just give us a quick readout of what they were thinking? Was does the benefit of heavy government government subsidy for food security outweigh the risk? And the options to answer were yes, yes, but only in the short term, and no. Um, and about 50% of webinar participants said yes, but only in the short term, um, with about 32% saying no, and 20% 20, 20 saying not sure, it depends. Um, we asked another question for the first moderated question, and it was, is smallholder use of a subsidized input or technology sticky enough to continue post-subsidy? Um, and overwhelmingly, people responded that it not overwhelmingly, about half, 60%, um, with 27% saying yes. And then the last poll that we asked was, um, it was a statement, there is a trade-off between commercial pathways and reaching the poorest. True or false? 90% 90, 90 of people said true. Um, so I'll start out with a question from Robert Navin. Um, and it's, it's kind of a clarifying question um, that could go to either one of you, Dan or Richard. Um, and it's, what is the definition of smallholder in Zambia? Um, and then a follow-on question, what was the ratio of increased hectarage over time by smallholders versus large-scale ex-Zimbabwe white farmers? <laughs> and was animal traction or mechanized plowing enriching? So pretty specific, but um, kind of <laughs> getting into the studies a little bit more. Sorry, what was the first question again? The first question is, um, what is the definition of smallholder in Zambia? If I can jump in, because I want to take the easy ones and let Dan handle the hard one. Uh, large farmers no longer grow maize um, and haven't for quite a while. Um, and the reason for that is because of the FR. I didn't get into it, and it's complicated to explain. But basically, because of the FRA input subsidy scheme, uh, out, uh, buying scheme, it's created distortions in the prices that wholesalers and processors are willing to pay for maize, um, especially because sometimes, as I alluded to, the government dumps the maize at lower prices. And it's made it basically impossible for large farmers to compete. Okay. Uh, and so they don't. They grow other things. They tend to grow other cash crops like tobacco, or cotton, or other things. Uh, the animal traction issue is quite interesting, particularly in southern province. Um, there are CT fly and other problems, and at least when I was there, a lot of the animal stock has been wiped out. So not only are they not using tractors, they're not even using animal traction because it often takes them several years to be able to put together enough money again to buy a pair of uh, oxen. And so you actually have farmers growing a hectare or two or three using hand hoeing. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, basic. Um, and uh, they're so mechanization is, not, is basically not being used, certainly not in the southern province, for maize. Uh, there is some animal traction, and there is a surprisingly large amount of hand hoeing uh, left. Uh, defining smallholder, I am going to pass that. I will answer it if Dan doesn't want to, but uh, <laughs> it's a very complicated definition in, in Zambia. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the the government's definition, the Zambian government's definition is offhand. Our, on the current project, I'm not sure what the specific definition was in the pri previous project, but in the current project, it's two hectares or less. But, um, but, but yeah. Well, I guess just then to amplify it, it does tend to be two hectares or less, but as I alluded to, the reason it gets really tricky in Zambia is because you can have farmers that have a fair bit of land, but they don't cultivate it or it's not very good land. Then you can have farmers who have really good land that's close to the market, even if it's only a hectare or two, and are, are obviously doing commercial. Um, so the standard definition has been small is uh, less than five by the government, and then emerging is five to ten, and bigger than that is considered a large farmer. But those land sizes don't really correspond to what you would like to think of as more commercial. Are they subsistence or even not subsistence? Are they not barely? Are they food insecure? Not sub, even, are they subsistence? And if they have a good year, they, they sell some, or are they primary orienting to the market? And I suspect Michigan State has some numbers on that, but I haven't seen those numbers. And I think that's the right question. And there's only a loose correlation between that, the answer to that question and actually the amount of land they own. Yeah, I think 
I mean, because the, the current project works within field crops, but also within, within vegetables. And unsurprisingly, our vegetable farmers who are producing on maybe 2,000 square meters closer to Lusaka have by far the highest revenues of, you know, on average of the farmers in, in the program that are relative to those that are growing field crops across two or three hectares. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's at best a very imperfect proxy, um, particularly when you're, you're dealing with farming populations who have a wide range of options commercially of what they could be growing. And you talked about uh, the project when uh, there was a good amount of uh, analysis kind of looking at the endogenous uh, was what was happening on the ground and using that as the basis for their design. How did they approach the challenge of basically the tension between that approach and then kind of the, the common challenge of having indicators that were short-term oriented and kind of pushing them sort of fast results uh, direction. Did they have the benefit of a more enlightened design or did they sort of do things in parallel so that they were kind of trying to hit earlier indicators that were that were put into the project one uh, or how did they how did they approach that? Yeah so I mean it's a common problem that you run into with you know just trying to figure out how you're going to smooth out the the implementation versus results time frame over the course of these projects. Um, I mean, this was only one set of activities within a much larger portfolio of other value chains um, that deployed a, a wider range of, of activities. And my, my sense from looking back, um, you know, it's always hard to do. I wasn't there. But my sense of looking back was that there, was, there were still a lot more direct activities going on within these communities in terms of training and other things. Um, but in terms of the in terms of what they were doing on the input supply side, this that, that bought them some time in terms of of, uh, of of waiting to see what would happen with the rest of it. If I can answer a slightly different version of that question, I want to come back to the one of the last points Dan made on his slides, which is the importance of a flexible approach. Um, to foreshadow what I think is going to be the conclusion of the five studies that we're doing, even though we've only done two, is that we, because I know some of the other projects, some of the other cases a little bit, one of the very strong recommendations I think we're going to be making is that USAID really needs to move to a very different way of designing its procurements, contracting, and particularly its monitoring and evaluation away from, here's this amount of money, we want to see this number of farmers and these crops in this number of years. Um, and here are the activities to, um, we want you to work in this sector, and the overall goals are to move the numbers up on farmers' productivity, malnutrition, food security, et cetera, et cetera. But how you do that, we are going to renegotiate with you every year based on, use Dan's metaphor, what the constraints are, what the waves, the riptides look like. Yeah, I actually liked, I think, if we stick to the, here's the top of the mountain, and we've plotted out the path, well, I've done it. I used to do a lot of backpacking. I used to get lost all the time. Okay, I was always finding that I was always off trail, and then I'd have to take a compass reading and try to figure out where I was, and have to plot a new course. And what we're seeing, uh, I like to call it the virtuous spiral approach, which is okay. We want to go from whatever the numbers are: 10,000 farmers use hybrid maize to 30 or 40 or 50. What are the constraints from that happening? Well, right now there are no agro dealers. Okay, so well, how can we make a profit for agro dealers or these agents to do that? Well, that gets us only so far, but then we discover maybe there's not enough breeder seed or foundation seed. So now, or, or the seed they're using is crappy because the certification system doesn't work very well. So now we have to work on the certification system. Well, okay, we get that going, but now there's not enough credit for enough farmers to buy that. So now we have to work on credit instruments. And um, the case I'm kind of implicitly describing, or two cases actually, is the... Uh, the Economic Growth Project, which was actually in French, Projet Croissance Economique, in Senegal, which did exactly that. And I think the most important thing you can take away from that is that the Senegal mission worked very closely with the implementing partner. They sat down every year and say, what are the constraints from us moving forward? And they changed substantially the work plan and the intermediate objectives every year. And uh, we're about to do a study of the Bangladesh CISA MI project, which was a mechanization project, and the same thing. The project initially targeted maize and wheat farmers. They brought in a bunch of machinery services, and the people who adopted them were rice farmers, fish farmers, and horticulture farmers. 
And rather than say, okay, we have to stick to our plan and we, have, we don't care all these market results that you got that look really promising. We're going to force you to focus on meat and ways and ram it down their throats, whether they like it or not, whether it's profitable or not, whether the commercial sector is responding or not. No, we're going to take the commercial the feedback from the market. If the market says rice, fish, and, and horticulture, let's go in that direction. If the market liked these two machines but not those two machines, we're going to go in that direction. That's what the mission did. Now, I think these are extraordinary. I mean, if you work with people in USAID missions, many of them are extraordinary. And, but particularly in these two cases, really the, the flexibility and the willingness not to sort of just have that sort of Soviet-style central planning <laughs> mentality. I, I sometimes joke that USA contracts are the last Soviet system <laughs> on, uh, on the planet. Again, I do not speak for the agency on that one. Um, but um, you know, our contracting mechanisms need to reflect the market approach that we are talking about implementing. Uh, and that means responding flexibly to the feedback we get from farmers and other parts of the value chain about what's working and not, as opposed to you know, we're the experts, we have the solution, we know the objectives, we have the, you know, five-year goals, and we're going to get there no matter what the market says. question is from Simon Winter, and he is interested in how carefully and purposefully the partnerships between government, donors, and the private sector in the studies that you looked at were structured, um, or were the various stakeholders working independently and incidentally? I'd just like to hear more about that. Um, well, the, in the, the profit case, the partnerships, I mean, the, the profit project was working with the Ministry of Agriculture in, in everything that it was working on, um, in the sort of standard, um, the standard coordination that you would, you would find for a project like that. Um, but the, the partnerships with the private sector were very intentionally designed. I mean, they were all structured around MOUs and grants. Some of them were grants, some of them weren't grants, some of them were just an agreement to help design a partnership and, uh, and, and help them think through some issues. And, um, and so th my sense was that, that at the margin, obviously, there's a reason why we tend to try to push to formalize these things, particularly if we have to end up capturing results coming out of them um, from the private sector partner. But uh, again, that, I think there's a, there's a value to parsimony in those things, too. Only formalize it to the extent necessary, and then that gives you flexibility in, as you're moving forward. So in the case that I looked at, the donor role was pretty much confined to CIMIT's uh, partnerships with both the private sector companies on the one hand, and they continue to work with the national research institutes that do breeding in Zambia and develop maize. So because of the strong private sector presence, the public sector role is much less than it is in other countries. And I want to highlight that. I, I think, uh, again, as Dan said, you know, it's a contextual thing. Uh, I think you'd have to search pretty far and wide to find more than another two or three countries in Africa, for sure, sub-Saharan Africa, that have seed sectors that look anywhere close to the strength of the Zambian seed sector. And, and so in this case, CIMIT was able to work closely, but only on the breeding you know, and research, and, and the seed companies took the baton from there and did all the legwork in terms of marketing and distribution and sales. Um, in countries where the seed sector doesn't look like that, uh, we've seen that the CG institutions, not just CIMIT, but others have really struggled because they tend, at least historically, not to be very good at commercialization or they tend to only work with the national research institution partners and, and they, it is the demo project solution and we've seen in the past that in the vast majority of cases, demo projects are not sufficient to get you to critical mass and scale. They may be necessary, but they're not sufficient. And so I think that's sort of the, uh, the Zambian case may kind of be an exception that proves the rule. Yeah, and I'd, you know, I'd highlight as well that th we're talking about the maize market because it's, it's, it's dominated by hybrids. You move into any of the other key crops like soy or groundnut, you, you still run into a massive problem, any, any OPV. The market is just much harder from a, from a seed production standpoint to make work. And consistently, and obviously this isn't just at Zambia, but there's every year, particularly years after there's been a particularly bumper grain crop, so farmers are not holding back as much, you have a chronic seed shortage within, within soy and groundnut and any other OPV as well. So there's, I think there, I think in terms of thinking through the challenges and the market dynamics of how do we make a private sector seed system work, 
how do we link these research programs around um, improving germplasm to an actual commercial distribution scheme within OPV dominant crops? That's a totally different and much more challenging question, and I think it's probably going to require a lot more public sector investment down chain for a lot longer until we can figure out how that works. I can just pick up on the OPV question because it is extremely critical. I think there's been a in, the, in our sector in agriculture that the advantage of OPVs is farmers don't have to buy them every year and then you just sort of get them out there and then they just let them rip and the farmers just use the stuff over and over again. The problem with that is that especially smaller and semi-literate or illiterate farmers in more remote areas do not really understand how to select seeds um, from the OPVs they're growing. And so even though genetically, so to speak, the material may not be um, deteriorating in quality the way a hybrid will sort of start to revert to its parent lines over years de facto because they don't know how to, they aren't selecting good seeds, two, three, four years later you're basically growing grain and, uh, or whatever the plant may, the, the product may be. And, you know, what we've seen in a number of other countries, again, I just was back from Senegal, that the major thing, the, the, the OPVs that were put in place were put in the, in the mid-90s, but by the mid-2000s, they were growing crap. And, um, and the major intervention was to put in certify, a very strong and very solid certified seed uh, system. And the farmers are buying the certified OPVs in rice because they are so much more productive. So um, this is, I think, a critical thing. And, uh, and as Dan said, um, this is something that often the very weak public sector systems have a hard time doing. And, and I think this is a perfect example where public-private partnerships are getting the private sector heavily involved in seed production and seed processing and certification can be quite critical. Uh, I just got back from Switzerland. Traveling with uh, and one of the folks that the folks who run the programs for the input suppliers trying to develop is, um, one of their immediate concerns right now is where we are when in the global agricultural business cycle. And they're receiving they're getting a lot more pressure to increase their profit margins from smallholder farmers. And there is less tolerance internally for a long-term investment in smallholder farmers. So their concern is that over time, they're going to be asked to cut back and pull in some costs. And maybe they're going to have to focus most of their efforts on that emerging scale, the 5 to 20 hectares, or the folks who are you know maybe that 2 to 5 hectares closer to major roads. So some of the places where we were um, uh, in, in the northwestern province, it's just not going to internally make sense given the new requirements that are being faced in terms of pro producing profits. So I don't know if you encountered any of that, um, but I'd be curious to know what impact you think that might have um, on some of the programs in, that you're running in Zambia or elsewhere. That I mean, that, that core question of geography that Richard talked about, I mean, it's, it's more profound than just the, the input access, right? I mean, this, you're talking about um, just objective levels of poverty increasing the further out from these major roadways that you get. And that's, I mean, it's, it's not hard to understand the feedback loops between the distance from transport, distance from any, not just markets, but other public services tend to be less, you know, more politically marginalized the further away from these roadways you are. So I think that's, that is just a core issue. I mean, the what what I think is really important to not forget, particularly from the the donor side or the or you know an implementer in this project in partnership with these companies, is that the transaction costs due to distance and due to the quality of the roadways are beyond your ambit and they're beyond the ambit of the company to fix. And so the first thing you should be doing when you're trying to figure out whether or not you know if you're going to start trying to work out a partnership over the long term with with, with with some of these larger companies, um, both buyers or input suppliers, is you need to run run the numbers on what that's actually going to look like for them to supply, both in terms of time, logistics, um, fuel, staff, trucks, 
it's very easy for those costs alone to overwhelm the business case for them to actually expand into these areas. And in that situation, you sh shouldn't be wasting five years of your project beating your head against a wall. You should be bringing those results to the government who is probably working with some sort of larger investment in terms of figuring out what their next 5, 10, 20 year infrastructure development plan is and say, look, if you guys can extend this road out another 100 kilometers, you know, we can estimate this impact. So I do think there's a lot of, of ground in terms of trying to link up the, the value chain approach to some of these larger level other multilateral investment schemes that do tend to work more on the infrastructure side in trying to help them figure out how to most efficiently allocate those investment resources um, based on where we see these market failures that otherwise could be there, uh, could be solved. If I can pick up on that, I, I want to repeat and highlight something I said before and extend it, which is depending upon how profitable this stuff is, as you get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 kilometers away from these roads, the transaction costs swamp the increased profitability and basically nobody wants to go there. Um, Mark was kind enough to mention that I've been helping DFS feed the future program for a while now, and particularly in the case of Tanzania where they were supporting rice among other things, I, I think, again, in terms of how the agency goes forward with this, we really need to change our M&E, which currently the M&E is largely designed to produce accountability for the agency that the implementing partner is achieving its objectives. But it's not designed to create a learning and feedback mechanism so that on an annual work plan basis, missions and their implementing partners can make good decisions, work plans, in reaction to what they're finding out. One of the key things in this was where to scale up the rice that they were introducing. And we didn't have data on where, at what point, how far from the road does the, the business case flip from a positive to a negative. So how can you decide to scale up if you don't have disaggregated crop budget data depending upon what kind of yields you're getting, what you're paying for inputs, how much the transaction costs are to get your product to market. And um, I think what we came up with on some, uh, I'm an expert at back of the envelope calculations. Mark and I have actually huddled over a couple of spreadsheets for two days, per, you know, trying to get some handle on some of these things in several countries. Is that I think you need to, as sort of to build on what Dan said, like a fill in strategy. Right now it's profitable 20, 30, 40 kilometers, so let's kind of push that envelope. We'd like to think that if there's now enough farmers doing this stuff 20, 30, 40 kilometers from the road, in two, three, four, five years, some input suppliers may create a business 30 kilometers away or 40 kilometers away, which would then allow us to move the frontier another 10, 20. So to start to sort of think about this sort of layered or wave or, these are not the right metaphors, but you understand what I'm saying. Uh, of as how can we help the commercial sector fill in as the roads get better, as the population density gets better, as critical mass is achieved so that input suppliers are willing to create businesses further and further out and move with that. But again, that requires an M&E system which is measuring where are the input suppliers, how do, what is the geographic gradient of the business case as you get away from roads and input suppliers or, uh, and also the market on the output side. And currently, most projects don't do that because they don't have to. They're not being asked to do that question, and they're asked to being hit quantitative objectives. And then when you look at the numbers, gee, isn't it odd that all the smallholders they work with are within 20 kilometers of the road? You know, when in fact the poor, you know, we ask the question, are there contradictions between commercial approach and smallholders? The answer is no, as long as you're in a place where they can make money, which turns out to exclude vast amounts of rural producers because the transaction costs become too high. We're going to try to squeeze in two more questions. Uh, we'll take a question from the webinar audience and then we'll bring it back in person. Okay, this question is from Natalia. And she was wondering if both of you could speak to um, whether there were any gender assessments in the studies that you looked at. Um, and how scaling up maize affected um, both women and men in Zambia, considering the different accessibility to inputs, land, support, et cetera. So we did, um, there, well, so the, two things. One, um, the presentation that uh, Jennifer Sepsat did that I said is, uh, I mentioned is on microlinks from several years ago, uh, did much more explicitly focus on 
um, potential gender dynamics between male and female agents and then what those what that implied for their relationship with female or male farmers, were there any salient differences? There's some interesting um, learning that comes out of that. So I'd recommend definitely taking a look at that. Um, we did we did try to um, we did include some questions which tried to, to disaggregate uh, some implications there, um, particularly at the, the interview level where we were surveying um, the farmers. The, so in the you know talking with the input suppliers and the and the agents, um, you know asking them about their strategies. Um, several of them have started developing bifurcated marketing strategies where where different branded um, things are distributed to women versus men uh, d depending on what they wanted and. And there was there was one funny anecdote where the one of the maize companies was talking about how they how they um, yields are going to the um, we what we ended up finding was that a number of the smallholder farmer the, the the women smallholder farmers that we talked to um, particularly liked the fact that these that the the agents were were within their communities and we did find that. That particularly within these communities, which tend to be much more geographically constrained for women um, than men, that ex that expansion of the geographic reach, if you're within, you know, if they're within the village, right, uh, did seem to have an acutely positive effect on them. We didn't find any other, um, you know, particularly notable uh, differences in terms of, of of how the expansion affected them. Most of the input suppliers and agents had no, um, you know, they were equally interested in you know, female farmers. They didn't. Report any other differences in their approaches, and so yeah, I think that was the only really notable thing that we found. Uh, in general, we looked at gender, and I cannot tell you the number of focus group discussions I have with farmers. I say so because there are always, almost always women present. Do you have challenges, in particular, in adopting or implementing hybrid maize seed that um, are, you feel have something to do, peculiar to do, is the word, but have something to do with, you know? As a woman, and by and large, the answer was no. Um, the Zambia is not as heavily affected by HIV as some of the other southern uh, African countries. But in the cases where there were widows present who tended, after I found out, I didn't ask them directly, but found out indirectly that they were HIV widows, that has been a problem. And in general, um, because women tend to have less access to financial resources, and one of the tricky businesses when you're talking about scaling up and adoption is what does that mean? Okay, are you using hybrid maize seed or not? The answer is usually yes. Are you using it? How many hectares of hybrid maize are you planting? Three. How, what percentage of that are you planting with hybrid maize versus hybrid maize seed that you saved from last year versus OPVs or, or traditional varieties that you have? And generally speaking, what you find with the women is that because they have less access to resources, they're planting less. In other words, for the, the farmer, the question is, will I get my allocation from FISP, which is enough for a hectare, but if I have two or three hectares, do I have the money to buy new seeds for that? And the tendency, the answer tends to be for poor farmers, and, and because women tend to have less access to resources, the answer is often less of that additional land is being planted uh, with hybrid maize. Uh, and also, the women, in particular, suffer from lack of animal traction. Um, uh, so those were the issues that came up. Um, the one thing I should mention is we didn't. Uh, Dan and I, I guess, were trying to be discreet, but the um, this program, in particular, has been um, what is the nice word for corruption? Highly inefficient mm -hmm. in many ways. And one of them is the fact that there's a lot of local discretion about who gets access to FIS subsidies. Legally, that I don't believe that a, both a husband and a wife are allowed to, but we, in some areas I was, they both got it. And in many cases, the wife would give her FISP allocation to the husband. Um, and, um, and then I would be in other places where even though the women would have their own uh, plot, in some cases, um, I said, well, did you get FISP? Oh, no, that's illegal. We can only get it one person per household, so go figure. I just want to mention something briefly coming back to the seed certification. I forgot to mention that Zambia has an outstanding and extremely well-regarded seed certification system, which was, again, started in the, in the 90s um, and actually a little bit before. And a lot of the initial money and impetus and TA came from Swedish CETA. And those buildings and a lot of the equipment, unfortunately, which is now 20 or 30 years old, is still there and still being used. And the private sector has been hugely supportive 
because when Zambian seeds are exported to Kenya or Zimbabwe or Malawi or all that, they want people to know that this is first-rate seed. And so in the last recent years, because actually donors have not, the, neither the government nor the donors have really been supporting the seed certification, the private sector has been helping in buying machines and updating the quality of the things. And one of the markers for this, at least it's the only country I know where it's the case, which probably is just a question of my ignorance, but when agri-dealers receive their maize seed for the year, and if they don't sell it all, they are required to return it to the seed company, and the seed company is required to recertify it for the next year before they can resell it. And at least of the countries I've worked in, I've never heard of that before. Um, so, but, I mean, I think that gives you a sense of, of what's going on there. Take our last in-person question. I want to help Mark out here. Uh, I don't need a mic. I'm uh, my mic. Okay, um, so it's, it's complicated, and let me say why. First of all, uh, what you picked up on is when we talk about, I supposedly have expertise in scaling up, um, when we talk about scaling, we distinguish what I call from intensive versus extensive. Intensive being higher yields, extensive being more inputs or more, particularly more land. Most of the scaling in, Mala in Zambia has, in fact, been extensive. As I mentioned, the productivity yields have been, I wouldn't say low, but 20, 30 percent is not enormous, especially over, let's say, five years, uh, whereas the land surface has doubled. Um, part of that, in my opinion, is, in fact, because FRA has been putting out pretty high prices and also is buying in very rural areas for explicit political reasons. In other words, we can get support in the most rural parts of the country because we buy their maize. Um, so that's complicated. There is, has been, and continues to be a very serious effort in Zambia of conservation agriculture. Um, the Conservation Farmers Union is out there pushing it and a number of other projects. But here's the problem. Okay, remember, if we circle back to the beginning of this whole presentation, particularly the focus of our studies, and I think implicitly, well, Dan will speak for himself, um, has been focusing on scaling up through commercial pathways because as a donor, or I'm not a donor, but as donors that I work for, we don't have the resources to reach millions and millions of people. So how do we get enough of a critical mass and enough commercial buy-in for that to go to scale? Well, you can see how people make money off of selling hybrid maize, e even with the issues we've raised about the distribution networks in rural areas and transaction costs. How do you make money on scaling up conservation agriculture? Okay, and that has been a problem. And um, the farmers are not that interested. I mean, the ones who've been shown it are interested in it. But the other thing about some of these things is when um, I'm an economist by training, and I really want to second what uh, Dan said at the very beginning, that you really need to take a multi-sector, multidisciplinary approach. The short answer when people say, well, how do you scale stuff up? I say, hire an anthropologist, okay? I'm not an agronomist. And the reason for that is even in conservation and agriculture, not only do people look at crop budgets, they, but they really look at risk. And they also look at the demands on their resources, particularly labor. And at least the perception, rightly or wrongly, and my understanding from the experts is wrongly, is that conservation agriculture is much more labor intensive. Okay? That's what the farmers perceive. That's not what the experts tell me, but the farmers perceive. And they are busy. Okay? It's not like these guys are just sitting around during the you know, land prep season saying, geez, I got an extra six or eight hours a day. What? Oh, I could go dig some holes. You know, I could, you know, dig these basins, okay? And so this notion that we don't understand that it's this top-down expert technology, agronomist-driven thing as opposed to what are the real challenges that farmers are facing and how do we work with their constraints, whether it's on land, labor, uh, if they're women, intra-household access to resources and decision-making. If you don't understand those things, then you don't, that you think of, look, guys, this, this seed grows four times more. Well, actually, it's only 20% more because all the other things you need to get to four times more, you don't have access to. And well, but what about the labor demands? What about access to inputs? Where am I going to sell this stuff? How is it going to affect, um, you know, my risk? If I buy, if I put another thousand dollars in inputs and I have a bad season and I go bankrupt, what does that do for me then? Okay, 
So those are all the questions we need to be asking, and crop budgets just scratch the surface, not to mention the fact that the crop budgets change when you're 30 or 40, 50 kilometers from the input and output market. So a much more sophisticated, nuanced understanding of the quote-unquote calculation. They may be illiterate or enumerate, but these guys know what they're doing, and they are making those calculations in their hand about land, labor trade-offs, risk calculations, and uh, we need to really understand what their decision-making process is. And you know, there's been a revolution in behavioral economics, but as far as I see, it has yet to really uh, reach the ground level in a lot of uh, agricultural projects. And just really quickly to to add on, to, so just to be clear, I'm I also work as a on the the follow-on to the Profit Project, but which is implemented by ACDI Voca called Profit Plus. And under that project, um, we we are pursuing a lot of things around this issue. So we've got several field trials looking at intercropping with pigeon pea as a way to, to, to try to reduce some of the synthetic input use. Um, but what you're really talking about is, is, is what's known as Javon's paradox, where increases in efficiency lead to increases in consumption, in this case of land. And it's been a core problem around, I mean, the idea that, that you can somehow, um, as farmers start to make more money off of their existing land holdings, constrain the amount of land that they're going to put under production moving forward, when it's now just now starting to make them money, um, is I don't know anyone who's actually managed to sort that out. I mean, you can look at the Brazil case as, uh, you know, as, as probably the, the top case doing that. So all, I think that they're, they're, the real key is going to be figuring out, in the long run, we know that in, in commercializing, uh, at, in, in, in agricultural sectors like the maize market in, in Zambia, you're going to have pressures on land, putting more land under production. How do you reduce, how do you reduce the impact of that land that's go, uh, on, on the impact on that land as it's going into production. And that means shifting uh, into more sophisticated and complex cultivation systems, working on some shade-grown agroforestry um, options. And there's a lot of interesting research going on. And I think um, hopefully this next year or so, we should be getting some really good learning on that that we'll be talking about from a project perspective as well. OK, just to add a, a word on that, a lot of the USA projects, Feed the Future projects that I've seen have a strategy to try to help farmers get a high enough increase in productivity on their subsistence grain or their staple grain for them to move into horticulture. And then say that, oh, I'm making so much money in horticulture, I don't need all this extra land uh, and all that. And it's, you know, talk about context dependent. I mean, it really is a complicated calculation. In some cases where they've developed horticulture activities or dairy or other things like that that are high money makers, the farmers refuse to get out of maize until they're, or, or even decrease the amount of maize they're producing. And in other places, the way to get them to increase productivity is actually to go to horticulture first. So what's the right pathway? Is it stable grains and then it's a higher value added stuff like court and dairy? Or is it court and dairy, wow, this is so attractive, I can now get out of that? And the answer, unfortunately, is actually it's very context dependent and it really depends. Richard and Dan, and thank you everyone for attending.